Ni hao everybody, I'm Jay from A Guy In His Games. Welcome to my review of Shenmue 3, we're gonna get straight into it, but first off, I'd like you guys to go and watch my reviews of Shenmue 1 and 2. I don't need to prove to anybody that I'm a fan, I've been a fan for 20 plus years, and I've, I've been waiting for the day that Shenmue 3 was announced, and became a thing, and do you know what? The fact we've got Shenmue 3 is just amazing, like in this day and age. You know, a lot of fans ask for things like uh, the Resident Evil 2 remake or DMC5, and we got it. And we are for Shenmue 3, and we got it, and I think that's incredible. So I've got to give massive respect to people that backed this, this project, you know, and backed the Kickstarter. So yeah, hats off to you guys. Okay, so let's get into this. Um, going into this, I'm going to have positives and negatives. And the reason why I'm telling you guys to go and watch my reviews of the first Shenmue and Shenmue 2 is because it will allow you to understand that this is coming from a fan's point of view when we get into the negatives. So I know there's going to be people in the comments that share differing opinions and that's fine. But let's not get like, you know, funny and stuff and start acting up just because as a fan I have some, some problems with this game. Uh, but first off, let's start with the, with the positives first. I want to start with the positives first. This game looks incredible to a Shenmue fan. It looks incredible. A lot of people are saying oh, it's not that realistic looking and the graphics are kind of crappy and they're like last gen. I will admit that this game wouldn't be out of place on the OG Xbox, you know. It looks like an original Xbox game. Um, I remember Ninja Gaiden and Otagi and games like that that look kind of similar to this. And I'd be lying to myself and you guys and a bit of an, and, and come across like a bit of an idiot if I didn't admit that it does look like a an old gen type game. But then I'm not someone who really goes by graphics. If a game's fun and enjoyable then you know it could look a little bit like crap and i wouldn't care this doesn't look like crap by the way but there are old school games like the old resident evils i still play to this day and i still enjoy thoroughly and the graphics don't bother me so you know to uh to put this game down because it's a little lacking in the more realistic looking graphics department is a is a fucking cheap shot in my opinion it might look slightly last gen but the actual vistas in this game the locations you get to visit are beautiful to look at you have vistas of mountains and meadows of, of flowers and just greenery in Bailu village then you have Niawu which is this city that's surrounded by water it's a little bit like a Chinese style Venice city um, and it has all these old rustic temples and shops and stuff that you can go into the game's extremely vibrant and colorful and very pleasing to the eyes or at least pleasing to Shenmue fans eyes and um, you have these old 80s neon signs that point you to a, a street fight you know it's the art style and the visuals and locations and how peaceful and beautiful everything is um, that really put a smile on my face as a Shenmue fan and it doesn't do a disservice to the previous games It doesn't do a disservice to the Shenmue name in that respect. So yeah graphically. I am very happy I'm pleased. It's not always about graphics and how good a game looks or how realistic it looks You know that doesn't make the game good. That's what I'm trying to say So Shenmue 3 is a joy to play through and it's very uh, It's a visual treat definitely for Shenmue fans if you're into sort of oriental culture and martial arts films like I am and just you know the way that martial arts films look then you're going to like this as well if you're not familiar with this series okay so next let's talk about controls um which i mentioned previously uh it controls very well you know now you don't have to control rio using the, the d-pad um and then look with the the analog because obviously we're not playing on a dreamcast anymore so you can move rio with one of the analog sticks and you can look around and stuff you've got full freedom of movement basically you can rotate the camera around as character model you can go into first person look at things you know it's um very intuitive it controls perfectly fine uh, to run you still have to hold like the r2 button or a shoulder button like you did you know in previous games it's perfectly fine have no issue with that interacting with npcs and objects and stuff and taking them you know taking objects is still the x button and uh, reading your diary you know and your notes and stuff is still square the pause the game's a bit strange um it gives you hints as well so when you pause the game you have to press triangle that i believe pauses the game i'm still yeah it does it does because it stops the timer and stuff it stops the clock so yeah and then while you're in that pause menu you can look at the hints and tips it offers you circle still cancels things like if you're inspecting an item you want to put it back down you you press circle and get out of it so you know on the hd collection if you got it for the ps4 it's circle to you know to cancel anything um i can't remember what button it was on the dreamcast controller but they're sort of mapped the same so yeah fight controls when you do get into fights it's sort of square to a uh, kick or knee 
it's X to, to actually kick, you know, to do like a roundhouse kick. Um, circle is like an uppercut and then triangle is just a flurry of punches. Um, you can also pull off combos once you learn them. So pressing X and circle gives you a special move. Same with square and X, you know, triangle and circle and so on and so forth. You can block by holding the L1 button. And dodging attacks, combos and maneuvering Rio is fairly easy now because you're using the analog stick. So you kind of just double tap it and he'll dodge out of the way and stuff of combos. Overall, the combat is fun. Um, I prefer the older combat and fighting system in the older games. But I still think this is a, a decent progression of that system. You know, an upgrade which is okay i like it it's fun it's very beat em up style um it's a bit button mashy but it does the job and it's very serviceable as a fighting system uh fights overall like the mechanics and stuff they're cool they are good they're fine um there are some negatives though that i'm gonna throw in here just quickly uh sometimes the the hits don't connect um it's a little bit messy at times bearing in mind this is a, a title that was made on a budget so yeah sometimes the connections are a bit off and uh, it can be a bit messy like with how it looks and kind of how everything plays out just the mechanics in general are a bit messy um i personally think that just throwing a couple you know punch combos and then a kick to knock the opponents down um or just doing your your more harder attacks is the best way to go so yeah it's very beat em up style um you know unlike games like ninja guide and devil may cry i don't know onomusha just games that require a certain type of skill that if you fuck up it's your fault like bloodborne if you fuck up that's your fault um shemu isn't really like that shemu 3 is not really like that it's rough around the edges is what i'm trying to say but it's still fun to take part and fight it's very fun in, in fact like when you pull off that um that combo where rio does a couple like you know low blow punches and then does this crazy palm like move that is wicked like it's so fun to pull off so yeah um still fun the the combat system still fun but it's a little bit messy and, and rough around the edges. So that's what I will say. Interacting with NPCs, um, trying to find hidden items, all that stuff, selling your, your items for money, for cash, gambling, all that stuff makes a return in Shenmue 3, uh, forklift driving, chopping wood jobs. A job that didn't make its way from Shenmue 2, which sucks a little bit, is being able to kind of man the, the gambling sort of stands and stuff like that, and stalls. You can't do that in this one, you can just gamble at them. So yeah, I wish that would have made its way from Shenmue 2. Yeah, I know it became a little bit boring and tedious to have to do those sort of jobs, you know, manning these gambling stands, but at the same time, chopping wood for like the hundredth time becomes boring and tedious anyway, so they might as well just added, you know, another job in there. But other than that, all the gameplay from previous Shenmue's does make its way into this game, um, and it's stuff that you'll you'll be familiar with. For the rest of you who aren't really familiar with Shenmue as a series, it's a martial arts detective story. That's what it is. You go around, you talk to NPCs, you get information from them, find out about clues and secrets, you search for hidden items. Ultimately, Shenmue 3 is about world building, um, you know, exploring these locations, all these diverse locations with you know, people that live in them and go about their day-to-day -day routines and then, you know, go about their daily lives. And uh, Rio getting to know these people, getting to know these towns, these villages, cities, um, and integrating himself into them for, for, you know, a certain amount of time before he has to move on and continue with his journey. And that's what I've always loved about the series, and Shemmy 3 is no different. It still continues that tradition and does it very well at that. What more do I love about this game? Well, the characters, for, for one thing. Um, Shemmy 3 has a very anime style. It's not trying to be uh, realistic looking, you know, it's not trying to be the best looking game ever made. We all knew that going into this, um, but I love its art style, like I said previously. I think the characters are great, the NPCs are great, because they all have these really, like, just anime-style faces, and it gives them so much personality, and I think that just adds to the fun of the game. And like I said previously, gives it this unique style and art style all of its own, um, and that's that's kind of what we wanted. We didn't want something that was trying to be hyper-realistic, and I think the characters are a testament to, you know, the fun um, sort of side of this game and the more cheeky side of this game. I mean, they know uh, what they were creating anyway. It's not that they were creating these characters and and may, and they had to make them that way because you at one point point in the game you walk past a, a stall in Niawu and uh, it's got all these like pictures and stuff, all this art, and they're like really goofy, cartoony looking characters. So they knew what they were doing when they created this game, and that's the style they went with. That's the artistic style they went with, and I'm glad they did that. Because Shemu's always been this anime type, you know, type game. I know the first and second probably were trying to look a bit more realistic for the time. Um, 
but they still had a cartoony look to them. They still do. So yeah, you know, Shenmue 3 is kind of continuing that tradition and I'm happy they, they did that. And music. Let's talk about music. So the, the music in Shenmue is incredible. It's absolutely beautifully done. Like in Shenmue 3, beautifully done once again. We get some, some tracks that are slightly remixed from previous games. Stuff that actually makes its way straight from previous games, which I was really happy about. And of course, we get some new compositions in there as well. I think the soundtrack to Shenmue is as much an integral part of this series just like the art style the graphics the characters everything else that makes this game up you know the forklift driving all that stuff um so yeah the music i am very very happy with i think it's a great score and uh you know it does does the shemu series proud in terms of locations they really hit the mark with this game um bailu village reminds me a lot of rio's kind of hometown in japan um, but it's just a lot more peaceful, a lot more, there's a lot more greenery, you know, a lot more flowers, and it's a little less technological, you know, than his hometown, um, but I love Bailu Village, I absolutely loved it, and the way that, you know, at first it feels so closed off, and you can't explore and stuff, and then as you progress in the story, it opens up more, it feels like this village has been hidden from society for quite a long time, there's a few things that make their way from the outside world, like the Panda Arcade, and things like that, you know, like some technology, like we have generators and stuff that power lights, and things like that, we have arcade machines, you know, and you get this feeling that the, the townsfolk, or the people that have set up shops, here um, have brought this stuff from the outside world into the village the village itself is very rustic you know it has all these old temples and all these kind of old shacks and things that the villagers live in um, and it's just extremely peaceful and it just reminds me of that first half of Shenmue 1 where you get to know all the townspeople of Ryo's hometown you know you're familiar with everything and you live there for a certain amount of time and you integrate yourself into this this little society this little community um, and that's what it feels like to me and I loved it for that because you know, I wanted an area. In, in Shenmue 2, you just, you branch out. You know, you go to China, uh, Hong Kong. You're in Wan Chai and then Kowloon and then eventually make your way to Guilin. Uh, but you branch out. Like, Rio is never in the same place kind of more than once. He's always branching out, getting further into the city, you know, Wan Chai. Uh, and then obviously going to Kowloon and stuff. In this, it feels like you live in Bailu Village for quite some time, you know? And so you get to know the townspeople quite well, you know? And it does feel like uh, Rio's hometown from Shenmue 1, uh, where he gets to know everybody and you get to know all these characters, all these NPCs. And that's how Bailu Village feels to me. Although it just looks a lot, a lot more beautiful, you know? And a lot, it's more stunning um, because Rio's hometown is just very structured and business-like, you know, as you'd expect a, a town in the middle of Japan in the 1980s to be and to look. So of course it fits with that game, you know? That location fits with that game. Uh, Bailu Village is obviously completely different and that's why I like it, like, because, you know, we're not getting the same thing sort of like twice we get in a different location some somewhere we've never explored before but at the same time it feels like Rio's hometown that you explore in the first Shamu and that's what I really liked about this this game because it has the best of both worlds it has the uh, the locations and feelings of Shamu 1 and then later on it feels like a little bit like Shamu 2 a lot like Shemu 2, actually. All the townspeople have their own personalities, you know. There's this old blind woman who senses Rio, you know, and she's a bit wary of you. She knows you're with Shenhua, but um, she doesn't kind of trust you at first, and later on she opens up to you. Um, there's this old, not monk, but he's this old, very powerful martial artist, this drunk martial artist that you, you know, you have to do some tasks for and stuff before he teaches you the special move. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, because it's one of the negatives, but yeah, he's cool. He's a great character. He gets you to chase chickens, you know, at one point uh, to just build up your reflexes and, and your skills and test your skills. So he's cool. You've obviously got people who own shops and things within the town. That opens up a little bit. At first, Rio can only go to certain areas because he'll turn he'll turn back and say, "Look, I can't go there yet. I have to go somewhere else." You know, I have to proceed with this this task before I go to to, to this other place. So that's how they open up uh, a lot of Bailu Village. It's a little bit jarring at first because you're thinking, is this what it's going to be like for the rest of the game? Am I not going to be able to visit these places? Are they only going to be available to me, you know, during story segments of the game? That's not the case. Um, I feel like the first few moments of the game are just the training parts of the game, you know, getting you familiar with, with like, the world and getting back into Shenmue. And I think that's one thing that 
time has done for this game. Um, it's allowed us to step back into this world after being away from it for so long. You know, unless you've played the HD collection. Even if you've played the HD collection, it's not a, a, a new Shemu experience unless you're playing it for the first time. For the rest of us, you know, we're just going back and replaying these classics. And I think that having this long period of time before we've had a new Shemu experience has definitely done the game a favour. Um, because I feel like if this had come out straight after Shemu 2 and it's exactly like what it is, you know, like what we're getting with this game, I feel like we would have probably got a little bit fatigued. And the series might have felt a little bit stale, I've got to be honest, with this game. Um, but because there's been so much time that's, you know, that's passed since the second one, and we got this game, stepping back into the world of Shenmue is as extraordinary and magical as it was back when I was playing the first game. Um, it's great to just get back into this series and, and see this new take on, on the world of Shenmue. Having said that, I do feel like Shenmue 3 is a bridge from Shenmue 2 to Shenmue 4. It's that middle game, and it feels like that middle game. And if this had come out just after Shenmue 2 and was exactly like we get here, I have to be 100% honest with you guys and myself, I would have felt a little bit fatigued. I would have. I mean, I, I would have wanted to see the story continuing. You know, I didn't want to wait 18 plus years for this, this sequel, but we've had to. And I do feel like time has allowed us to appreciate this game more, you know, as fans. So yeah. In no way, shape or form, is that a bad thing? Is it a negative? You know, I'm aiming at this game. Is that actually a positive thing? The fact that we've had to wait for so long, the fact that we, we couldn't wait to get our hands on this game. And when we finally get to play it, it's not actually disappointing. It's actually a, a cool experience. It's, it's a good Shenmue game, you know, that is a testament to the work and the man hours that have gone into, you know, producing this game especially with a budget of 7.2 million or whatever it rounded up to in the end um yeah it's it's an incredible feat i mean you're getting two fairly large size locations to explore in this game you know the graphics ain't that bad okay they might look a little bit original xbox but they're not that bad and in places like i said the locations if we take a look at locations separately from like the character you know models and things like that and designs the locations are incredible to look at like they're so beautiful like the vistas and there's there's no pop-up no pop-in and no issues there like they look great they really look good if we look at Nyawu, the city that you visit after bailu village it's so different it's more bustling than bailu village you know it's it's a city so you expect that um it takes you back to shenmue 2 and and that game's locations you know with uh one chai and uh and kowloon and i'd, I'd say that Nyawu is very different from one chai or kowloon it's a little bit like the two mashed together in some ways Maybe more one chai than Kowloon, but yeah. It's a great new location for Ryo to explore, and it does remind me of Shenmue 2's locations, but this is just as epic and big in scale, and just as interesting to, to walk around and, you know, explore. Unlike Bailu Village, it's a lot more technologically advanced. There's a lot more neon 80s type signs around the place. You've got these tourist attractions, the old temples and stuff that still exist that you can go and visit. And uh, there's a lot of arcades to go and play in. It is a lot like the locations from Shenmue 2, you know. It's just another extension of what China has to offer as a setting, you know. So this is an extension to that. And it's different enough that it doesn't feel samey or like a location you've been to previously. Yeah, it shares similarities with, you know, Wan Chai and Kowloon. But of course that's going to... That's going to happen because it's still in China. It's still a Chinese city, so yeah. What makes this city stand out from those previous cities you visited is the fact that it's kind of surrounded by water. Like I said previously, it's almost like an Asian-style Venice city. And um, I think that gives it so much character and, you know, differentiates it from... The previous cities you visited but yeah i think the bailu and niawu are great locations definitely and people saying that they didn't really uh, enjoy bailu village you know it's too slow etc etc they they found niawu to be a better location and the game kind of kicks off um, as you reach Niawu. I don't agree with that. I like Bailu for its more calm, tranquil, and peaceful setting. Uh, it doesn't mean that I like it more than Niawu. I like Niawu more than Bailu. I think they both complement each other perfectly. But Bailu does offer up a slower, more chilled experience, whereas Niawu does step, step up a gear, you know, as you reach it. Um, but that's just to do with sort of like the settings in general, you know, one is a sleepy village somewhere in Guilin and the other is a hustling bustling city with arcades and street fights, you know, so that's why you get two different experiences. I think it mixes the best of both worlds, Shenmue 1 
more slower pace of Shenmue 1 with the more faster pace of Shenmue 2 and uh, it works it definitely works to its testament as you integrate yourself into the the population of Niawu you also get a, a forklift job to earn yourself some money so you don't have to like chop wood constantly now to make money you can actually drive a forklift around um, and you actually get to meet Delin's brother I think his name was Delin in Shenmue 2 and he's the one that you know gives you the job now yes I'm one of those weirdos that really enjoys the forklift driving I love the forklift gameplay in this game like taking you know uh, arcade cabinets from from the warehouse to the boat and dropping them off and making sure that you got them in the squares perfectly and then stacking everything and trying to get more things kind of loaded on the boat before the time was up yeah i loved it it was a callback to show me one it was great it looked great it handled well yeah it was brilliant um so yeah love the forklift driving and stuff and that forklift gameplay was brilliant uh one thing that i'm disappointed we don't get is darts we don't get to play darts in this game as far as i could see or you know i didn't find any sort of like any of those dark kind of machines but we do get a whack-a-mole style game a basketball mini game as well you shoot for the hoop and you can win prizes a golf variation of that same basketball game uh we also get the qte boxing you know mini game that makes its way from previous shenmues um they had to include that you know it's iconic still as hard as nails though to try and get like top top high scores it gets harder so mini games wise i wasn't disappointed i thought all the new games were a welcome addition and uh, and i liked all the previous ones that returned from from previous entries yeah mini games were were spot on in this game i liked them i enjoyed them and the same goes for all the gambling mini games as well like lucky hit and rolling on top yeah they were really well done and I enjoyed playing them right up until a certain point in the game where I got fed up of them. But we'll talk about that in the negative section. For now, we're talking positives. Um, so what haven't I covered? I've pretty much covered everything that I really like about the game. I mean, this is off the top of my head, so there might be things I miss and stuff. Uh, one thing I will say is you can get into fights easily. There is street fights in the Aowu. Um, there is this temple, you know, filled with monks. In both cities, actually, there's two temples with monks. And you can fight them and sharpen your skills, upgrade your abilities, master special moves during sparring, um, then you can actually sort of fight these monks and these martial artists in Bailu and in, you know, Niawu and, uh, and actually move up the ranks. So eventually you become like 6th Duan or you become 10th Duan. Um, I didn't actually beat the last guy in Niawu, the 10th Duan fighter, you know, the monk. So yeah, I'm not too sure if you get anything for just beating all the martial artists from these temples and eventually, like after you finish the 10th Duan one, you get something at the end of it. I mean, you probably get like a, a trophy or something, but I'm not sure if you get, you know, like a big reward for it. I didn't when I beat all the uh, the martial arts you know in Bailu village so yeah that was disappointing that was definitely disappointing but i did enjoy the sparring and the fighting side of things in fact when you get to now you can take on multiple opponents i didn't really bother doing that because i'd already taken on multiple opponents you know during this point of the game fighting the red snakes so yeah it didn't appeal to me i just you know i'd already done it so i didn't bother doing that you can also get into a street fight in uh in Niawu. there's this this section where you can go to and you could enter a tournament uh, you you win tokens from you know beating all these fighters and stuff and what I loved is there's fighters from the dock where you get your forklift job who actually appear as well to fight you and stuff so I thought that was brilliant um, it just adds to the the world and stuff you know of this game and makes this world feel more real and lived in you know so yeah it was great fighting people from you know all around like Niawu in the street fighter but yeah you can you can test your skills take on these opponents and um, it got a little bit heavy sort of as I I beat more and more opponents so i didn't actually finish every street fight i'm not even sure if you can maybe it just carries on and stuff but yeah i won a lot of tokens i won like 2000 maybe 3000 tokens so yeah i cashed those in and got some prizes from it so yeah you can just you can just fight in this game you can get into fights and stuff and and test your skills which is cool which i really like seeing as this is a martial arts adventure you want to be you know practicing your martial arts and getting into fights and stuff so you can do that freely in this game at points the qte sections of the game are good they're not as prominent as they are in previous games but they are fun once you get to take part in them same thing happens if you fail them you know uh, you just restart a certain
certain section of them and then continue. There was one that stood out to me. It was the most epic one in my opinion. It's where Rio is chasing two members of the Red Snakes through the, you know, through the city and the Awu, chasing them through uh, the market stores and stuff like that. So that was really good. That was a standout. Also during these sections, there's some comedic moments which I, I found really funny actually. It just harkens back to old school martial arts films and stuff. And yeah, the comedic moments are handled really well and I found myself chuckling and laughing at those moments. So that was really well handled. I mean, this game isn't like just comedic all the way through. There are serious points and stuff, but it does it does know when to have fun and, you know, and even laugh at itself at times. So I really respected that. Overall script and voice acting is of a normal Shenmue standard. It's kind of campy, kind of cheesy. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. You know, the translations and stuff are a bit weird in this game, uh, but you do have the option to play it with the original, I think, Japanese, you know, voiceovers and stuff. So yeah, it's your decision whether you want to play with it dubbed. But overall, the script just adds to that charm that Shenmue, you know, has, has held for so long and, and this game's no different. And one of the last positives I can aim at this game before we move on to the negatives is it's quite a lengthy experience. The world is quite big um, and there's lots to do and, and loads to explore. So yeah, it's a lengthy experience, probably around the same length as Shenmue 2. I think it's slightly shorter just by a little bit, um, by a hair, but... Overall, it's the same length as Shenmue 2. It's quite a lengthy experience. Yu Suzuki and YSNet did actually say that it was going to be lengthy, and it is. So get a lot of bang for your buck, is what I'm trying to say. Lots to do and lots to explore. It allows you to play the game at your own pace, and I love experiences like that. I love games like that. You know, the original Resident Evils, uh, Metroid Prime, all those games allow you to kind of progress at your own pace, and you don't have to rush unless you want to. And if you want to, then you can. So that's all the positives that I can think of off the top of my head, you know, that uh, make this experience in this game a true Shenmue sequel. This is a true Shenmue game, a true Shenmue sequel. There's no denying that, but it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There are issues, there are problems, and there are some things that nearly had me giving up the game for a little bit, you know, for a couple of days. Now, something I didn't mention in the first half, because I feel like it's a good thing and a bad thing, is the RPG elements of the game. Uh, while I enjoy upgrading Ryo, you know, and, you know, upgrading his endurance and his kung fu and skills and, you know, all that stuff. That's all great, you know. Um, when you're fighting martial artists and monks and stuff and you're, you're mastering your techniques, these new techniques that you learn from scrolls or books, all that stuff is great. You know, it makes you feel like you're accomplishing something, you know, by upgrading Ryo and getting stronger and better and then also filling up your stamina bar so you you can upgrade your stamina bar you know and and get it bigger uh while all that is great you know and i enjoy that i'm from the school of bloodborne so i i like that game i like that you have to you know upgrade your character in that game um it also comes with problems and issues the one inch punch training and the horse dance training is great at first the first few times you do it then when you're you're having to do that over and over and over again it's just those two things that you can do horse dance and one inch punch as much as i think one inch punch and horse dance was extremely cool and very martial arts in its presentation i would have liked a bit more diversity in how you train so you only get these two things and after about the 50th time of doing this and believe me we'll be doing this a lot if you want to upgrade your your stamina meter um it gets very very old and very very quick so yeah, that is a big issue. You have to keep doing horse dance and one inch punch. And, and when you master them, I've only played this game once, okay? I've only played through this once. I will be playing it again at some point in the future. Um, when you've mastered those those two things, you can't, you can't like learn further. So you can't upgrade further for doing those after you've mastered them. Now, maybe I'm missing something and I'm just being a bit of a dumbass. To be honest, I did look up some guides online on Google and stuff and on YouTube and I wasn't really prepared to sit through an hour of, of watching someone else play the game when I can play the game, you know? I even went on to Reddit, I even scoured Reddit to see if anyone was uh, was giving hints and tips, but as I was playing through the game there wasn't really, there wasn't really any hints and tips, there wasn't many guides and I wasn't willing to sit through YouTube videos that were an hour long and so I just played played through the game and if there were more ways to upgrade Rio um, via different different things that aren't a horse dance or one inch punch then i didn't find them i'm pretty sure that horse dance and one inch punch are the only things you can do outside of fighting monks and getting technique scrolls and books uh, to upgrade rio and there wasn't much diversity in that i think they could have added a few more training mini games in there definitely so that was very lacking and a bit disappointing if i'm honest and that's a problem that i have with this game is there's a lot of repetition that is a 
big issue with this game. Yeah, I know that previous Shenmue games have been repetitive in some ways, but this felt like it was more repetitive, definitely. There were some things you have to do that are extremely repetitive, and those two things are part of that. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, you can obtain new technique scrolls and, and learn new moves by fighting monks and martial arts and stuff at these temples, and that's great. Um, but once I've mastered these two things, that was it. I couldn't proceed any further. So I'm going to get this out of the way now. Um, there's two parts in the game that had me <laughs> infuriated, actually fucking pissed off. Like, I'm going to be honest. And this this is, I, I'm going to call back to earlier when I said that there was something that made me want to put the controller down, turn the game off for a couple of days and then go back to it. Because I was so vexed like i was pissed off by this about halfway through the bailu village missions you meet this this master he's this drunk martial arts master you need to learn this technique off him to defeat these thugs who are terrorizing the village and have kidnapped this uh, this dude this basically this nobody that i didn't even i didn't even know who the hell he was but he got kidnapped you know in part of, part of the village and these thugs take up residence in this particular part of the village and you have to you know chase him out basically essentially rio gets his ass kicked before actually by this one thug he's the kind of leader and he's the big big heavy type dude and later on with the red snakes you know the gang that you chase um they've got like a, a similar type of type of leader he's big you know but he's really good at martial arts we'll get to that a little bit later but for now this guy is a challenge for rio Azuki. he's quite tough to beat and he, he kicks rio's ass a few times and I didn't really understand that because in previous games, Ryo has, has fought some very, very tough enemies. I didn't think this guy would be anything, you know, compared to Hazuki, but he does. He causes a problem. Now, I understand it, you know. It's all about Ryo getting stronger and overcoming, you know, certain fighters and, and more skilled opponents. And this game's no different, but I, I would have thought that this guy would have just been more imposing, in my personal opinion. Maybe because he's big, he's a little bit tougher. But either way, Ryo gets his ass kicked a few times and then he has to seek guidance and also training from this, uh, from this martial artist. Who, you know, a lot of people don't really see because he's just very elusive. He keeps to, to himself... Um, and he lives in this old abandoned like temple. Once you meet him and you get a meeting with him, you have to provide him with a dumpling and some cheap wine. Uh, he comes out and you confront him and essentially you ask him to train you. Yeah, but he says there's one condition. He wants 50 year old aged alcohol. So you then have to go and buy that. The one thing you find out is it costs about 3,000 yuan. You don't have 3,000 yuan at this point in the game. Uh, in fact, I was struggling, and we're going to get into it. So, why did I not have this money saved up? Why could, why in this game could I not buy clothes and all this extra stuff? Why did I miss missions, like side missions of the kid wanting the elusive white fishing lure and, you know, other things like that, and that one kid who wanted this elusive, like, pickup truck or whatever it was. It was a little toy of a pickup truck from the capsule machines. Uh, why didn't I have the money just to waste? Because... In this game, the stamina bar depletes constantly, all the time. Whether you run, it depletes. Whether you fight, it depletes. Whether you breathe, it depletes. This thing is terrible. They shouldn't have um, made it so unforgiving. That's the problem with this. And so you end up having to eat food to replenish your stamina bar. Otherwise, you can't run anywhere. You have to walk everywhere. So how do you do that? Well, you buy food. And what's the best food to buy? Weirdly enough, it's black garlic. Black garlic costs, I don't know, maybe like 20 yuan or something, or maybe not that much, but it's like 5 yuan, and then it adds up and adds up and adds up. And you need loads of this, you know, in your, your inventory in order to just re replenish your um, stamina bar. That's why I didn't have any money, because I had to keep spending it to, to buy, like, this black garlic so that I could replenish my stamina bar. I didn't really know that something like this would have shown up, and if it did, I wouldn't have thought it was so much like you won to have to, to buy this thing um and this is where i started to get frustrated because essentially the best way to make money and this is my big another big issue with this game is you have to like go and gamble this is the easiest way i went and gambled on roll it on top so it's this dice game where if you have higher numbers than the dealer now most of the time it works out in your favor you get higher numbers than the dealer and you end up winning uh, but if you lose you lose your tokens so 
You need to get tokens and then exchange tokens at a prize shop to get prizes and then sell them to make loads of yuan. Um, the best prizes to get are like these gems. They they give you they net you the most sort of like value. So then you go to the pawn shop, you pawn them, and you end up getting yuan. You don't get as much yuan from these gems as you would tokens from Roll It on Top. And to make more and more well money, you have to get more and more tokens. This is even confusing me me just trying to explain it but um it's not that confusing it's just long it's long-winded and it's a fucking long process believe me so you get more tokens say you bet 1500 tokens to get obviously you know that back yeah so you double your money or you double your tokens um you end up betting high on roll it on top so that you can make that quickly and then go to the the prize exchange exchange the the tokens you know and get the prizes you need probably about eight eight gems i believe or something like that to get enough yuan to buy this 50 year old liquor that takes a long time and if you fail at roll it on top or whatever you know gambling game that you're playing um you can at least manually save the game so you essentially have to reload the game and hope that you win the you know the second time round or the third time round it's a very long process i don't remember doing this in shemu 2 if i remember right um, you could just go to a gambling sort of den and gamble on something and, and just win the money You don't get that option in this you can't just gamble tokens or money, you know and win that back I think you should have had the option to do that um, Instead you end up having to get around 24,000 tokens Just to get eight gems so you can make that yuan and then spend that 3,000 yuan on a fucking item that you don't even want it doesn't mean anything to you it means something to this guy but it progresses the story and that is a huge fucking problem with this game the fact that it's progressing the story perfectly fine and then it stops and it just goes here do this and it's such a banal task and such a long-winded thing and it really becomes boring and frustrating it really does it ended up grating on me big time like having to play roll it on top winning and then losing re like reloading my game and doing that to make up 24,000 tokens it was ridiculous just so i could go and get eight gems and get my 3,000 yuan which in the end didn't mean shit because it all goes on this this fucking alcohol for this this drunk plonker so that i end up with nothing at the end of it really but it's also i can progress the story you know you have to do this task you have to take part in this mission otherwise you can't proceed in the game and everybody is going to have to do this and luckily there was some info online that I learned, you know, or I went on YouTube and watched some of these guides, um, and I was able to learn, yeah, this is the way to do it, but it's stupid, like, it would take ages, it would take ages of chopping wood, like, in the mini game, the chopping wood mini game. that's another thing, the chopping wood mini game, not a huge fan of it, like, it, it's very similar to the horse dance on one inch punch, at first it's like, this is cool, I like it, and the afterburner music's playing in the background and stuff, great, yeah, after about the 50th time of doing this to earn some money, to so earn some yuan, it's the only way you can earn you aren't directly i was like, i'm done i'm fed up i'm bored and you're not going to do that to earn like three thousand you aren't you're going to end up doing it the quicker way which is gambling on these you know these uh these mini games or just playing roll it on top like i did and hoping you come up you know tops basically this part of the game was not fun in the slightest it really wasn't and uh it slowed the pace of the game down to a crawl and that's never a good sign now you know when you're playing this game i don't think anyone's going to be able to uh to defend this particular part in the game you know this particular mission that you have to take on i really don't like if you do you do that's cool if you enjoyed that that's fine but I lost my patience with it and I was about to put my controller down. All I ended up doing was literally was press X, roll the dice. If I win, I win. If I lose, reload the game, then continue. Try and make up 24,000 tokens and then, you know, proceed. It felt worse than those moments in Red Dead 2 where I had to wait like 30 minutes for Arthur to, you know, travel on a horse from one destination to another and it took ages and all I did was press autopilot and watch youtube videos uh, this is worse because you actually have to interact with this you actually have to press buttons and stuff in order to place your bets you know or reload the game so yeah um not a good decision on why it's next part of yu suzuki i'm sorry like that was repetitive it was grindy grady and all in a bad way not in a good way you know not in a bloodborne way where you you grind like enemies and stuff it wasn't it didn't feel like that it was it was badly handled and i didn't like it um, and so once you get past that, you, you're taught this move, which isn't that special to be honest, but it was done well, it was cool, it's still cool, it's still a cool special move. Um, but yeah, like I would have thought after all this training, Rio would have known how to just counter, you know, 
uh, enemies and stuff. Anyway, use it on the opponent and you, you know, you fuck him up. And you interrogate him with Shenhua. But I don't want to talk about the story just yet. We're leaving that till later. Uh, what I do want to talk about is the fact that they do this twice. Not just once. Um, now, I anticipated something similar to Shenmue 2's building up the fight money. You have to go and gamble to make enough money to, to get get into fights and stuff, to get into the street fights, you know, participate in the street fights. Um, I did anticipate that something might make its way into this game like that. I didn't think it would be on the scale of this, but, you know, it is what it is. And I thought, it's cool. They're not going to do this twice. Yeah, well, they do it twice. Towards the end of your time in Niawu, um, you have to buy this special technique book. It costs 5,000 yuan this time, not 3,000. So you have to end up making around 35,000 tokens and then going to the pawn shop and pawning that, doing the same process you did back in Bailu Village to buy this fucking book. Luckily, the game ends soon after. No spoilers just yet. Um, and you don't have to keep paying for your room, you know, that you're renting and stuff like that in this apartment building. Uh, I say apartment building, it's like a hotel. It's more of a hotel. Yeah, so luckily the game ends sort of close to that, you know, when after you've bought the books, so you don't need to have this excess of money. But if you don't have uh, black garlic, you know, in abundance, and you haven't built up your, your items, you haven't got enough black garlic, well, you're going to need health for the last kind of battles and stuff. So you end up having to, you know, work again. Luckily, I didn't do that. I'd already thought ahead and bought loads of black garlic. But um, for some people, they might not think like that and they'll have to go and work a few more days you know on the docks and whatnot driving forklifts or chopping wood to build up that money or just you know gambling and making up that money in the same way that I did to get this 5,000 yuan um so yeah that is an issue um but luckily towards the end uh you might actually have built up enough yuan and have that saved over so yeah it won't, it won't be a problem for everybody I think Bailu Village is is task and mission will be for a lot of people, but I think uh, once you reach Niawu, there's just me not having enough yuan, really. So, yeah. Uh, luckily, I had like 1,200 yuan, so it wasn't too bad, you know, to get the 5,000, but it was still the same thing that they pulled in Bailu Village, and they did it here, and it, yeah, that f that got me fed up. And I've seen comments on YouTube uh, from people who are playing the game saying that they, they just stopped and uninstalled the game, or if they hadn't found out a way to do it easily like the ways that i've been doing it they would have just un uninstalled the game and given up and that's from like some shenmue fans so it's pretty bad it is extremely grindy and not fun in the slightest so yeah they do this twice in the game just be prepared and be warned if you haven't played this yet and if you haven't played this game yet then don't listen further because i'm gonna get into spoilers side quests in this game have no real significance or importance they don't really add anything to your quest um they're not fetch questy or you know repetitive like some people have said i never found that they're very diverse you at one point you have to find these kids who are playing hide and seek and they'll, they'll tell you you know something like a secret and stuff uh, and they give you something at the end of it which is like a capsule toy or something which in reality you can't sell for very much so it ends up being pointless like doing the side quest that's what i'm saying but if you want to do these side quests you can and they are interesting to take on there's even one where you have to um find the ghost of the, the temple yeah within Bailey village but you know you already know it's like the old drunk drunk martial artist um but you have to wait to a certain time and then go and talk to him you know because these kids want you to like find out about the ghost and it's all very very well done like the actual side quests themselves are interesting there's one where you know this uh, this young guy is a bit of a wet tissue he doesn't know how to fight and uh, you you kind of have to go and talk to this girl that he likes because he's too afraid to do it you know and it kicks off this side quest so the side quests themselves are very imaginative and i did like them enjoyed them i thought they were cool but what you get from the from it from completing these like giving this kid a soccer ball you have to win this say soccer ball i'm english giving this kid a football <laughs> You have to win it at a, uh, a gambling stand and then you can give them the football. It's a mini game of pale toss. You have to throw these bean bags in these, these buckets that have like either green, yellow or blue painted on them. And uh, the soccer ball is like green if I remember right. I could be wrong. I mean, you know, I've only played this game once. But yeah, you have to end up throwing it in that bucket to get the ball. Did I say soccer ball again? Football. Bloody football. I'm British. Jesus, I'm letting myself down. Uh, so yeah, you win that. You give it to the kid. And I think he gives you something like a rare crane capsule toy great okay thanks which gets like one yuan if you sell it something stupid like that or five yuan it's not not really significant you know in the grand scheme of things um one or two actual like side quests that i just avoided and i didn't do uh, and they knew that you might not do them because 
unlike the other side quests, they kind of end after you've talked to the, the, you know, the kids, like, more than once. The first one's with this big-headed kid, and uh, he asks you to get this rare fishing fishing lure, this white fishing lure capsule toy. That means you have to go to the capsule machine and just spend the yuan like nobody's business. And at this point in the game, you've probably only got, like, 150 yuan or maybe 200 yuan. And you will waste it, trust me, before you even find this thing. So I was like, hell no, like, this is going to ruin the whole game for me. I'm just going to leave it. And luckily, I went and talked to him and Rio said, sorry, mate, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get the, the capsule toy. Later on, there's this other kid at a stall and he wants you to get this rare, like, flatbed truck uh, capsule toy. And the same thing happens. So I was like, nah, forget it. Already tried that before. I'm going to leave this. So, yeah, once you talk to him after, like, the third time, Rio says, sorry. Sorry, dude, I couldn't get it. So, yeah. All in all, though, the side quests are fun other than those two. They are interesting and fun to take part in. They just don't give you very good rewards at the end of it. And I think that's a big issue. Like, they don't give you something that's, that's special. Like, I didn't get a, a Technique Scroll book from it, which I would have much preferred, or a piece of clothing, you know. It said you have to go and, and, uh, and get sets of herbs. That's another thing. Got to talk about the herbs thing perfectly fine go and pick your herbs like it it's fine a lot of open world games have you picking like herbs and stuff like from metal gear 5 to you know red dead redemption um it's something that's become quite a staple in open world games and you can sell these herbs to make you one that's actually one other thing you do sell herbs to make you one so directly you know you don't have to gamble and do all the other crap um and that's cool perfectly fine with that you can go and fish as well in the game i didn't partake in the fishing because i'm not that big into fishing but you can do that to make uh you want or own, earn tokens i didn't know because i didn't take part so i don't really know that but yeah you know you buy the equipment and then you go and fish so there are other ways to make you one i do go back on myself a little bit there are other ways but uh if you want to make big bucks you've got to you know gamble really essentially that's the best way and quickest way to, to do that but if you can get a list of herbs so you can fill out a complete list you'll be entitled to like a, a technique scroll or a technique book from the pawn shop same goes with the capsule toys etc etc uh, but some of them are really hard to find when it comes to capsule toys so as you can imagine filling out those sets is a lot harder than just the herb thing because you just sort of stumble across the herbs they're just there to pick you know and don't cost anything either to uh, to pick them so yeah, if you do fill those up, you can be rewarded with technique scrolls and technique books and get new techniques. Unfortunately, I didn't want to do that. Like, it's long-winded and I didn't have the yuan to do that. So I didn't. You know, I left it. Maybe my second playthrough, my new game plus, I'll be able to do those things. But for now, I didn't do that. Um, so that's one way to earn technique scrolls and, and books. But I would have liked that if you finish these side quests, you take part in these side quests, which I did. Um, or you, you kind of beat all the... The monks or the martial artists in the temples you get like a, a cool technique scroll or book or something that means something to you you know within the game you don't get none of that unfortunately or even a piece of clothing like an item of clothing for rio to wear but instead you kind of have to buy those for ridiculous prices and i was like i'm not i'm not about to do that i'm not prepared to do that i like rio's original look i don't want to like mess around you know with his look so i left it I happily left it, to be honest. Now, while I'm perfectly fine with the script, the voice acting, it's got that Shenmue charm. It doesn't offend me in, in the slightest. Characters, as well as Ryo, Shenhua, and all the other NPCs that you talk to, end up repeating themselves over and over and over again. And this becomes a bit grating. It gets a bit annoying. There's also some weird translation errors as well, where Ryo will ask an NPC something, and they'll say something completely different. That happens sometimes. Or, you know, you'll get the... Um, the typical like did you see a man in a suit the other day a red suit and then the npc will be like hmm red suit red suit and rio will say yes he was wearing a red suit and the guy will go red suit hmm can't say i have stuff like that really bugged me <laughs> i was like great you have no information there was this pointless this thing taking like i don't know the total of 10 seconds to go through before i can move on and uh there's something else that bugged me in the older Shenmue games, you could talk to characters, but then you could just walk off, like, mid-conversation. In this, you can't do that. Like, you have to literally keep finishing off the conversation, and that is really annoying. At times, you can uh, skip the conversation, but the game's very random in how you do this. Like, it's strange. Like, if it's the same day or you've reloaded a game, you'll be able to skip conversations you've had previously um, with the same character. But if it's a new day and you're talking to this character again, They'll pretty much say the same thing, but you have to sit through it all. 
And that's weird. That was a weird decision in my personal opinion. And it's not like you, Suzuki, and YSNet didn't know this would become frustrating and annoying. You're asked to pay your rent, you know, to pay your, your fee for staying at this hotel. The uh, the main lady will ask for you, but, you know, after the first time, you can just skip through that every day. Like, if you're if it's a new day and she asks you again, you can just skip through it. And then Ryo have this same conversation with Shenwa every time he goes to leave the hotel. The same exact conversation. And you can skip through that. So they knew that there were there were annoying moments like that. And they allowed you to skip them. But then when you talk to like an NPC just on a store or something, you know, selling something, like you have to sit through the conversation. It's quite strange. Uh, towards the end of the game, like I said, this is going to have spoilers in it. Um, you meet this one random just dude at a pawn shop um, in this almost abandoned uh, Chiyu Men hideout. Yeah, it's abandoned other than the Chiyu Men and this one dude, this, this, this one dude is has taken up shop and he's there and uh, he asks you to find these items you have to find these three items it's extremely random it, it's a strange change of pace you know it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me it was very weird maybe you guys thought different and it was okay for you but it was just very strange it seemed very strange it popped up this one dude just pops up from nowhere and he's like hey find these three items and then you can proceed so you have to do this to proceed with the game and the story um and then when you go back downstairs you've already sort of talked to him and you'll give him the items and that's cool and then he'll be he'll be like do you want to sell anything you know there are benefits to selling things blah de blah de blah etc etc ad infinitum and he does this every single time you give him a new item the item he's looking for and it drove me slowly insane i was like why can't you skip this he's already said this shit before i don't want to sell any items to this guy he keeps asking me and i'm almost locked in this loop of him asking me if i want to sell items to him after I've presented him with the items he's been looking for. It drove me a little bit insane. I was like, I just want to get to the ending and, and face, you know, the Chiyu men and face Land D. Um, so yeah, it was a really weird moment in the game, I've got to be honest. That, that like the, you know, the previous things I talked about where you have to build up big amounts of Yuan, really broke the pacing of the game. And the game's slow at times as well. It's quite a slow-paced experience, so to just drive it down to a crawl you know really really breaks the pacing and um, the pacing is a little bit off in this game like it didn't feel as well paced as the first one or the second one you know the first one's predominantly a slow experience the second one speeds it up a little bit more this was like slow fast slow fast like you know so yeah the pacing is a bit weird now like i stated earlier i don't really have any issues with the way the game looks the game plays etc etc the core rpg mechanics are perfectly fine other than the you know stamina meter depleting quickly these are all things that i like about the game you know the mini games etc the combat stuff like that i still think that's all cool um during cutscenes though and obviously during combat sometimes the character animations are a bit weird like they're a bit messy they're a bit janky now while they did vastly improve this from the previous trailers we'd seen and it's it's a lot better for it um some of the hits don't connect properly they don't it looks weird like i said it just all looks janky so there are some issues with animation still definitely um but some fights are really really cool especially when rio pulls off the you know the the side step like barge move that he's learned that's really cool like the reverse technique so he gets to use that on the leader of the red snakes and i was like that's pretty badass. That's a proper Ryo Hazuki moment. So yeah, I really love that stuff. But the animations are still a bit janky here and there. Especially when he fights Chaya. That just looked all kinds of weird. So, you know, there are some issues there that they could have tightened a little bit more. Um, and I do feel like maybe they just didn't bother in the end, you know. But they could have tightened it up a lot more, I, I think, personally. There is a slight issue with the day and night cycle. Now, while I love the fact that this game has... Uh, weather effects and day and night cycles i think that's brilliant sometimes or most of the time when transitioning from day to night it does it really quickly and a little unrealistically i know this game's not trying to be realistic but when it changes it just changes very very quickly and it's a bit um off-putting a bit disorientating so yeah there's an issue there also when it rains as much as i love it and it, it gets everything wet and stuff and floors look wet and rio looks a bit wet um the rain is hard to see sometimes when you're playing the game like it's a bit strange like, i had one moment where i don't know if it was a glitch but it was raining in bailu village and i could see the rain properly in the cutscene and um and then when it came to like getting out the cutscene and playing the game i couldn't really see it as well so i'm not really too sure what was going on there but it just you know it looked a bit strange now the game did actually glitch on me um not too much but it did glitch on me there was a point in the game where you go to the hotel and you could actually call your old friends it's a really cool point in the game you can call tom nizomi uh ayansan 
Ine-san, should I say? Or Ine-san. Ine-san. Some of the characters from Shenmue 2 that you meet. You know, it's great. Like, you actually get to speak to Gui Zhang, who's one of my favourite characters. So, yeah. Uh, I love that moment. Not all the voice actors return, which is to be expected. It is years and years after. I believe someone said that Nozomi's voice actress died, or one of the characters' voice actors died. So, yeah. You know, they've changed the voices and stuff. But it's still great. It, it fills in the gaps as to what's happened to them. It's all about the lore and, and world building with Shenmue. And it, it lets you see that this world has still continued. These ideas are still continuing, you know, long after the second game ended. So, it's great. This world still continues to live on. And this just added to all that stuff and it was great it was a great moment but at one point when i was trying to ring um nozomi again the game glitched on me and it just like it got rid of my um my diary and i couldn't select the numbers and stuff and it just had the blue kind of underline and then something else happened where it just it just crashed the game like and i couldn't get out of that that screen i couldn't get out of my you know my diary to to select any numbers or anything i couldn't exit nothing so i had to reload the game uh, from an earlier point the only thing i could think is that i was in the middle of a mission and i decided to ring nozomi at the wrong time um so the next time i i did the mission i just continued upstairs you know in the hotel and continued with the mission instead of going to the phone and ringing like nozomi or anyone else so yeah like that that was one crash that i did experience but other than that the game was pretty tight pretty tightly made um, there was no other issues now there is a big big issue and that's characters pop in out of nowhere sometimes um, and I do believe this is a bit of a, a glitch that needs to be fixed so in the older Shenmue games because of the hardware and the you know at the time wasn't powerful enough you'd have characters kind of popping in they would just appear out of nowhere and that was understandable back in the Dreamcast days maybe even the original Xbox days when um, you know they released Shenmue 2 on that but in this day and age, when you see characters just randomly popping in out of nowhere, like this one kid at that store I told you guys about, he just, for a while, he'll, he'll just be like invisible. And then when you go to a certain point where you go close to the store, he'll appear. Not such a big deal when you're just browsing stores and markets and stuff in the game, you know, but when you have to look for certain characters, like at one point you have to ask Ren a question and you have to kind of run around Niawu and try and find him, um, he could literally be invisible, walk past you and you wouldn't know. And that becomes a problem because you need to be aware that he's walking around so you can ask him this question. If he's invisible and only pops up after you've walked past him or run past him, that causes a, a big issue. So yeah, the pop-up thing with the characters and stuff, that shouldn't be present to be honest. That's pretty bad. Although the game does run at 60 frames per second, which is a good thing. Um, sometimes there is some slowdown stuff. When I was trying to buy that, that Technique book, um, the cutscene was slowing down heavily and I didn't really understand why, so that was the only time I really saw that happen and it was that bad. But yeah, every time I talked to this guy in the martial arts kind of uh, shop, it would slow down. So yeah, there's a, a few little issues there, but nothing that overall ruins the game for me, you know, the overall experience. So, story, let's move on to that, the last Part that i want to talk about um story is good it's fine yeah does the job anyway that's it uh end of the video uh, i've been jumping from guy in his games confused this isn't the end of the video this is how the game ends it ends so abruptly and just like that um so let's get through it it starts off with the ending from shemu 2 everything is accounted for it kind of looks very similar to how 2 ended obviously different graphics and stuff but still going through the same motions um the sword isn't present they sort of retcon that which is strange it's, it's built up to be this magical sword you know uh, this magical ancient sword and i don't remember seeing it in the beginning like i said i've only played through this game once there's a lot to take in you know when you play a game the first time um and witness a story for the first time but as far as i could tell the sword doesn't make an appearance in the beginning of the game you know it's revealed that the bell tower within bayou village is actually like this uh this special monument type of thing and you have to find these wooden key things at the end sort of towards the end when you're leaving Bailu village uh, the blind woman has them just lying around in her house and pff, she's just hid them somewhere and i guess can't find them because she's blind or something i don't know but rio ends up going through the whole like investigation type gameplay you know moving things going through drawers all that stuff's perfectly fine but yeah all the keys seem to be in her house you pick them up and um you go to the bell tower and you use them in this puzzle. Once you pass that puzzle, you have to do another puzzle, uh, which is like turning this rotating thing. I don't know exactly know what it was, but it's like a rotating thing that you turn. Uh, you do that puzzle, you finish that, and then Rio just suddenly 
reveals that he has the sword in his pocket, but it's more like a dagger. I always thought it was going to be massive and magical in some way, but it just ends up being a key for the for the bell tower. He slots that in, and re it reveals a scroll. They take the scroll, him and Shenhua, and uh, I think they find out that it's leading to Niawu, you know, that they have to go to Niawu next, and it's this scroll with the phoenix and dragon on it. So yeah, they kind of retcon the sword a little bit, definitely, like 100%, I think they've definitely retconned that. Um, yeah, and then things kind of move to Niawu. Now, you know, obviously I can't go over the whole story. This video is getting on a little bit, and it's quite long. It's a pretty long video for what it is, to be honest. I didn't think it would, would go on this long, but to get my points across and talk about this game, I guess that's just how it's turned out. Um, yeah, so, you know, characters that return. Shenhua, Chai, Landy, Niao. Niao's son is new, but she, uh, she has been hinted at in, you know, an old trailer. Uh, Ren reappears. Who else? I'm trying to think. Obviously, all the phone conversations. And you get Delin's brother as well. Characters it introduces. I guess uh, Niao Sun properly has a great twist with her. Uh, it also introduces some of the two men who are, in all regards, quite disappointing. <laughs> like, they're very disappointing. Let's just say that. The characterization in this game, other than Rio's, is a little bit flat. I'm going to be honest, it's flat. Um, you know, Shenhua doesn't really get any progress, like, to her character, added to her character. Uh, she's very one-note, very, like, she's not even as intriguing as she's been led up to be. Um, she's after her father, her and Ryo, obviously, still on the, the trail of her father, who's been kidnapped by the Chiyu men. And there's only one point in the game where I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And it's when she's trying to get information out of that, um, that you know, the leader of those thugs that Rio finds so hard to, to beat. And she does something. She tells Rio and these other two guards to leave, you know, this house. And then she does something and he ends up, like, pissing his pants and telling, telling you everything. It's not revealed what happens, uh, what she does, but it's very interesting. And it's mysterious. It adds to the mystery of her character because she's always been this mysterious character. So, but other than that, it's played very kind of just one note. Um, and when you get to Niao Wu, she like, just uh, her character just goes out the window. She's just there. She's just there accompanying Rio, you know. Uh, and they're looking for for her father. So, yeah, like the characterization of, of Shenhua wasn't handled very well. Massive opportunity and big disappointment is sort of what came into my head as I was playing through the game, and I wanted to get to know who the hell Shenhua was or Shenhua, should I say, was. Um, yeah, Landy. Pff, look, like I said, there's going to be spoilers. You don't get to really see much of this dude. He still plays it cool. He's still a badass. He's still Landy, but um, it kind of degrades his character, belittles his character because of the people he has around him. So. The Chiyu men actually turn out to be extremely disappointing and not actually that powerful. And they, these are the people that are supposed to be like his bodyguards. And they get their asses kicked by Ryo. Like, he literally takes them out in one blow. But he's been getting his ass kicked by the leader of a small gang like the Red Snakes. Or at least they're not a small gang, but, you know, they're just, the, they're not the Chiyu men. He's getting his ass kicked by the leader of them. He's getting his ass kicked by a couple of thugs in, in Bailu village. And suddenly he just takes out the Chiyu men with no problems. And people might say, yeah, but you know, he learnt new moves and new techniques in this game. Okay, but I swear he like, pit blows one of them. Like, that's one of the moves he does on one of them. They just were extremely underwhelming as characters. I expected more. Uh, Niao Son. There's this twist, this great twist. Spoilers, like I said, if you don't want to be spoiled, you shouldn't be watching the rest of this video. She actually turns out to be this girl that you've seen since you arrived in Niao Wu on the boat. She's on this boat, and she's this really cool, cool girl. She's like very like gentle, kind-hearted. This boy bumps into her at one point, you know, when you're exploring um, the rest of Niao Wu, the city of Niao Wu, and uh, she's all, all very like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? You know. And, helps him up and is just a really nice woman. And she's sort of like a love interest for Ryo. She's very similar to Nozomi, and I think that's what Yu Suzuki and team were hinting at, that she could become a love interest for Ryo. So you think, oh, potential love interest. It kind of takes your attention off of her in that way. Um, and I think you can bump into her at points as you're exploring, you know, Niawu. But I didn't when I was continuing with the main mission and stuff with the, with the story. I also think it's possible to bump into her as you're exploring the city, much like Ren and Shenhua. Uh, I didn't actually encounter her as I was continuing with the story, but I'm sure you can do that. It's not until you, you get to the Red Snake's hideout, you get your ass kicked a few times by them. And Ren and Ryo go back to the hideout for a third time that she's just sitting there on, like, this, this oil drum... 
just being really weird and she says that you know Shenhua has been kidnapped and they took her and there's not much they don't do anything to her you know she doesn't say anything she just tells you that information and you kind of put two and two together and think okay she's obviously a red snake she's she's involved with the red snakes I'm thinking oh maybe she's the sister of the the leader or something something like that um and then you find out that she's actually Niao Son She's Niao Sun, and when you get to see Niao Sun later on, it shows you the quick glimpses of the other girl and of Niao Sun, and you figure out, okay, like she covered herself up, you know, she was a bit more like Nizomi from Shenmu, um, and she had dark hair, but when she transformed into Niao Sun, she dyed her hair red, and she, you know, showed off a bit more cleavage, looked a bit more sexy, you know, she uses a sex appeal thing, so you're like, oh shit, like, that was a really good twist, that's like... One of the best twists in this series. I really love that twist. That's on a par with the ending of Shenmue 2. So I love that. I think Niao-san's a really good character, actually. I think she's cool. She's like a proper Chiyu Men member. She's very powerful, sneaky, snaky, and conniving. And she's trying to get control of the Chiyu Men from Landy. And I like that. I like the fact that she was trying to stab him in the back. So she's a great character. And the way they presented her character was brilliant. Because she's... Throughout this whole second half of the game, you know, she's in Niao Wu, but you don't know that she's Niao Sun until the very end. So I, I fucking love that. I think you and his team did that perfectly. The fact that you think she's going to be this love interest for Ryo and she actually turns out to be this antagonist. This, this long hinted at Chi Men member or Chi Woman member. Um, and yet yeah, they handled it perfectly. So the way uh, Ren's introduced into the game really good i actually didn't mind it i thought it was cool he just appears he's buying some uh some chow mein from a stall and rio just bumps into him we all knew that ren would be following rio anyway from the sort of the second game so yeah uh, the way he's reintroduced is just typical ren fashion like he's just like hey man i'm just you know i'm buying myself some noodles and rio's like what the hell are you doing he's like i heard there was treasure that's what i'm doing here i love the way he's, he's introduced so and ren's still ren like he's great like I love Ren as a character, so I'm glad he's in this. And Ren and Ryo continue their comedy duo act that they've got going on into this game, and I think it's brilliant. Some of the some of the things in it made me laugh, and like at the end, Ryo says, uh, "How are we even friends?" Like, which I it got a big laugh out of me um, as Ren like kicks this two men member in the face. Like, this dude's like Bruce Lee. You think he's gonna be a badass? He looks like Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, and then Ren just kicks him like square in the face and knocks him out. But that's my point, like, if Ren can take this, this motherfucker down and Ryo could take the other two down, then why the hell is Landy surrounding himself with these people? I mean, are they two men, you know, uh, through, I don't know, power and the fact that they are strong in their own right and so they were made two men members by someone else? Or are they actually these foot soldiers that Landy has selected? If so, then it kind of belittles uh, Landy's character because why would he surround himself with these incompetent fools? Like, do you know what I mean? You do, however, get to least fight Landy this time which I think is pretty cool um, but Rio doesn't get to hit him at all like Landy is super powerful like he's overly powerful he doesn't even if I'm right he doesn't even use two hands he just has one hand behind his back and the other one to kind of block um, and yeah he uses his feet a lot he just he fucks up Ren and he fucks up Rio and Ren and Rio escape this burning castle you know and he's just left there kind of being very calm and chill and very landy um because niao son has set it on fire and she's going off the treasure herself she wants to take the chiyu men for herself you know and uh screw landy over so yeah obviously landy doesn't die we know this do you know what i mean at one point ren buys this fake mirror and he throws out the window that's what makes landy let rio go and then they can escape the two of them escape and landy's left there as the building's burning obviously he doesn't die we know this um so yeah and there's an open window with like water all around so he obviously jumps into there. Or walks through the fire like the T-1000 out of Terminator 2 Judgment Day. I don't know. He's he's a badass. Who knows what he does um, to escape. But he will escape. And he will be in Shenmue 4. If there is a Shenmue 4. We'll get to that right at the very end. Now we do get some new characters in this story. But they are very short lived. They're pretty much just the people you meet in um, Niao Wu. And they exist just within this particular part of the story. You know. Uh, there's Sue, who is a student of Master Bay. He kind of, he's set up just to lead you to Master Bay, essentially. Uh, but he's still cool. He goes around the town and stuff, around the city, should I say. You know, and fights like the Red Snakes and stuff. So he's cool. He's like a proper hero and stuff. Sue's a pretty cool dude. He's a rotund fella. You know, he's big. 
but uh, he's really good at martial arts. So he teaches you some new, you know, some new techniques and stuff. We also get Master Bay, who is a uh, Sue's teacher. Master Bay is wicked. He's like this fisherman. Uh, I forget what the birds he he has and he uses to fish with are called. Core or somethings, uh, kind of like seagulls or just big, you know, fishing birds. And um, a lot of the fishermen in Niawu use these birds to, to catch fish for them. So, you know, Master Bay is is great at, at just martial arts. He's really cool like, as a character. He's a lot like the old guy from Shenmue 2. The name escapes me, I can't remember. But yeah, he's like the old guy who does Tai Chi in Shenmue 2. That's at least what he reminds me of. And he's very good at martial arts. He's like a master at his, his own style. And he teaches Rio the reverse, you know, strike technique or whatever it's called. Um, so yeah, which he uses on the leader of the Red Snakes. Then we have Shi Ling, who is like the shrine maiden of the local, you know, local shrine, the local Buddhist shrine. And she's really cool. Like she has this broom. At first she goes to hit Rio around the head. And he kind of like, you know, blocks her and stuff and they become friends. Um, all the characters are cool. Like, all the new characters that are introduced are cool. But they are just filler characters, in my personal opinion. There's no finality, no real goodbyes, you know. They kind of skip that. Unlike Shenmue 2 and the original Shenmue, where the characters just had a lot more gravitas and a, a lot more impact. And you got to know them more personally. My only criticism with them is they feel a little bit throwaway. That's, that's my only criticism. I would have liked to get to know them a little bit more, you know. But it's to be expected at the end of the day, Ryo's not going to get teary-eyed every time he meets people, you know, within the city. He has to keep moving on with his journey and his revenge mission against Landy. Uh, there is a great part of the end where he says, Landy, fight me. I will avenge my father. I love that bit. It's iconic. Very iconic now. For a Shenmue fan. Another character that makes his way into this game is the leader of the Red Snakes. Um, this big guy whose name escapes me, but he knows four different styles, or at least uses four different styles of martial arts against Ryo. Uh, one's a snake, one is the bear, I believe. Am I going to get this wrong? One's the dragon, and another one's the monkey. I think they're the four styles that he uses. And because he uses all four of these styles at once, he's extremely powerful. And he does seem like a foe that can go head to head and toe to toe with Ryo Hazuki. So, you know, I feel like Landy should have had him as one of his lieutenants because, you know, it takes quite a while to beat his ass, like, and then when you finally do, you know, it's an earned victory, but it's still, still a just barely one victory. And for that, I think he's a really good antagonist. I think he's a great foe for Ryo to have to go, you know, go head to head against. Chai makes a, a return in Shenmue 3 after seeing him in Shenmue 1 and the comic, you know, that bridges Shenmue 1 and, and 2. Um, and he is weak as shit in this game. Like, he just has like kind of three cameos, if I remember right. He's sort of around Bailu Village, you know, I guess he followed Ryo there or whatever. Uh, he appears. I feel like he was thrown in for fan service to be honest um in niawu he he's guarding the cells of uh shenhua's father and this other this other stonemason because shenhua's father is a stonemason and it seems like bailu village has a lot of stonemasons so you know um yeah he's guarding this cell and uh Ryo beats his ass once more he's yeah he's definitely like a a character that was put into this game because of fan expectations i think it doesn't really work you know i love chai from the first shenmue i'm glad that we do get to see him here but in the first shenmue he's such an intimidating foe in this you know you get to the end of shenmue one and you literally finally defeat him but in this he's not at all intimidating he's like he's become the golem of the shenmue series he's become that like character that just gets his ass kicked he's that comedy value character and unfortunately his character's downgraded to just these cameos you know he's just sort of thrown in there i mean it makes sense that he would be you know sort of going after rio and stuff because he works for the two men but yeah he's just lacking that presence he had in shenmue he's uh, a character that just gets beat on quite a lot so he's become that comedy value character unfortunately and his uh, his character's been downgraded a little bit happy to see chai you know making a return and stuff you know i prefer to have chai in the game but i think they could have done a lot more with his character i don't know i know he's someone that that rio has already defeated and kind of knows you know chai's style and stuff and he can he can take him out easier now but yeah i would have thought he'd put up a little bit more of a fight at least anyway you know it's good to have him there at least as for Shenhua's father, he holds a lot of info. He knows more about Landy than Ryo does, and I think he knows Iwao as well. Uh, but other than that stuff, he's quite a bland, boring character, to be honest. So this build-up and stuff, and he just ends up being a bit of a meh character. But still, you know, it's cool. We finally rescued him, finally got to meet him. So 
that's good. Um, all in all, look, we could keep going on and on and on about the story and whatever else, but realistically, the game ends. Big spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't finished this yet. The game ends with Landy being left um, in a burning, you know, castle. Um, Ren and Ryo escaping. Them leaving uh, Niawu with Shenhua, her father, Ren, and the other stonemason that was being held captive by the two men who... I don't know what the hell happened to him, but anyway. They leave their friends in Niawu and their friends in Bailu village and head to this cliff temple where it's believed the treasure is and niao Sun is heading along with the Chiyu men and Landy will be following. So yeah, they head over the Great Wall of China um, and they head to this this big stronghold, this, uh, this weird, like, market-looking place, you know, this huge castle-looking place. So who knows what's going to be beyond those gates, beyond the, the wall... Um, but it's very interesting and it ends on a cliffhanger not as in, as impactful as Shemu 2's cliffhanger um, and not as iconic but still a decent cliffhanger nonetheless and leaves me wanting to, to know more leaves me wanting to see Ren, Shenhua and Ryo you know progress and proceed in their journey uh, unfortunately we're not getting it with this game so it does end on that basically it ends on that as they're crossing the great wall to head to this, this huge stronghold with the tagline the story goes on or it's the story continues either one i think it's the story goes on so yeah and then fade to black credits roll the end that's the end of the game then you get new game plus and you can restart the game with uh, all your abilities and you know your um, stamina meter fully upgraded i haven't started new game plus yet so i'm not too sure i've just looked at it but i'm not too sure if your money continues over or your uh, your tokens that you want you know during gambling the first time around but yeah it's it's cool i'm gonna get uh get back into it in a couple of months maybe down the line and, and play new game plus but i'm gonna give my overall score for this game Hmm, this is a hard one. If I did score systems on a point, you know, system, it would be a like a 7.8 out of 10. As it is, I do think it earns that 8 because I did thoroughly enjoy my time with the game. Yeah, it is disappointing in some areas and uh, in a lot of ways, um, but there's also a lot to love about it as well. And, you know, we don't get many Shenmue games, we don't get many games like this. And that's why I think it's deserved of that 8 out of 10. I still think it's a great entry in, in the series. I just think it's that middle part of the story and that middle middle game, you know. Saying that though, the locations and stuff were absolutely gorgeous to explore and, and very beautiful. Uh, and a lot of fun, you know, to interact with NPCs and stuff. All that stuff is so well done in this game. It has to get an 8 out of 10. This game gets an 8 out of 10. The first Shenmue's a 9, the second one's a 10 out of 10, and I think Shenmue 3's an 8. It's an 8 out of 10. Having said that, it scrapes that score, I will say that, because there are moments in this game that really made me want to turn it off, which I've explained, you know, in detail earlier. So, you know, it's an 8 out of 10, it just scraped that 8 out of 10, but I'm happy to give it that score because um, it is a good addition, you know, to the series, it is. The story doesn't really move move anything forwards really in reality but it does give you a little bit of backstory of stuff on characters on the mirrors you know on Bailu village and Guilin and it does fill out the areas that need filling that's what I'm trying to say and um you know everything from the the feeling of it being this true Shenmue sequel to the atmosphere to just the vibe is just heavily Shenmue and that is why us fans love these games for that and it doesn't do any of that badly it does it perfectly and for that that's for that, it has to get that high score. It does because um, you know there's only a few games that I will pick up day one. Um, the, the Shenmue games, Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, Doom. You know, I'm trying to think. Metal Gear Solid. You know, when it was around, when Metal Gear was a thing <laughs> before it ended. Um, yeah, those were games that I'd happily go out and just you know buy day one and not wait. I'd just buy them for myself and play them. And uh, if you hold this game in that regard, I'm not disappointed. Like, I'm not disappointed in the money that I've spent on it. It's a sizable game, it's a lengthy game, and it's a Shenmue sequel in every shape and form that you can think of. Uh, so yeah, it does what it does perfectly well. It does what it does perfectly well. It is the most disappointing game, though, of 2019 for me. I think RE2 and DMC5 whooped the shit out of Shenmue 3. They were way better games, way better experiences, in my personal opinion. It's my personal opinion. But this is a, a good follow-up to those. You know, I am not fully, fully disappointed. I am happy, and I will be jumping back into this game, which means it's good, because I want to replay it. So, yeah. It's decent. It's a decent Shenmue game. Not as good as the first. Nowhere near as good as the second, but 
if we can hold them as a trilogy, one, two, and three, I could play these back to back, no problems. I'm perfectly fine with that. Now, if you guys have stuck with me for this long, long review, this is how much of a fan I am. Sometimes when I get into reviews like this, um, especially with a game this big and this lengthy and with so much history and characters and all the other stuff um, and so many mechanics, it's an RPG as well. I've got to remind you guys. So unlike Resi 2 or DMC5 or, you know, Doom or whatever, there's other reviews I've made on games. Um, I don't go as long because this is like a bigger a bigger game and it lasted a long time so i think an hour and 20 minutes is enough for this review but it shows you i'm passionate about this series and i'm passionate about this game and the the, the previous two games but there's one thing that that really sucks um this game hasn't sold well it's kind of flopped uh, i'm not sure what you and his team are going to do from here on out I don't know if they've got money left over. I believe they do from the Kickstarter, so they will probably put that into maybe Shenmue 4. I know that you wants to create two more Shenmue games to finish the story, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with them using the same engine and you know continuing continuing it and then finishing it with five. Please finish it with five or even four. You know, maybe maybe it's a good idea to finish it with four because this one has you know been kind of a flop. Um, so yeah, like. That's the problem, I and that's the problem I had going into this, knowing it wouldn't be the end of the story. Um, they had a lot of opportunities to end it with this game. They did, that's the truth. There's a lot of sort of dilly-dallying around in this game, and they could have filled those moments and added a bit more finality to, to proceedings, you know, and they don't. Um, and I feel like the Shenmue 4 might not happen, you know, and that's a, that's a big problem, like, because they've left it on a cliffhanger again, and we have to wait in anticipation to see if they make Shenmue 4. But I do think they might pull it off. I have a feeling they could pull it off and we'll get to, to see a Shenmue 4 materialize, you know, hopefully in a year. Hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe two years time. If Yu Suzuki and his team actually see this video, which I doubt they will, or anyone from the community sees this video, um, you know, let's try and end it with four. We can have three chapters or something. It could be a lot bigger than this one. I don't care about that, but I do feel like because this one's been financially a flop that you've got to end it at some point you have to do it with 4. And I know his vision and, and whatever else has to be sacrificed in some way, I get that, you know, and no one should ever sacrifice their vision, but when you just don't have the money and you don't have like a, a rabid fan base that's gonna, you know, help this game sell and help the series sell, you've got to think to yourself, how can I condense this and how can I finish the story, you know? And I think Shenmue 4 should be the one to, to, to finish it and end it all, you know? Three is a great kind of bridge, like I said, from two to four. Um, let's have four end it. You can do it, definitely. Like, it can be done. It can be slightly longer than a Shenmue 3 and, you know, it can have like three or four chapters, like like two did. I think two had like three chapters or something. No, it had four chapters. So you can have four chapters each chapter can have different locations that they go to and then the the final chapter is the end of it all i think that's what you and his team should do and i think if he sticks to that and he decides okay four is going to be the end we'll have a great quadrilogy and um yeah and we get some closure as well as fans and no one in the shenmue fan community is gonna is gonna not want to play a longer shenmue game you know, I feel like 3 should have gone on longer, personally, um, as a fan. So, yeah, we're not going to have no issues with that, um, Yu Suzuki and Wiresnet. So, please, make it happen. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we get a Shenmue 4 and it finishes the, the series off, you know, on a, on a high note. Now, originally, Shenmue 3 was going to be longer, actually. There was going to be Bailu Village, Chobu, which I think became Niawu, and then Baisha Village. And I think Baisha Village is what we're going to see in Shenmue 4. That's the... The city or the town or wherever it is that we get to see at the end of the Great Wall of China. Um, so I think that will be Baisha Village. He might change the name. I think he changed Trobu to Niaowu. So, you know, this was originally going to be a lot longer. Uh, I think just because of constraints and, you know, the time limit and the, the funding, he could only make the game as it is and he had to chop off some bits. So I think the bits he chopped off are going to lead into Shenmue 4. But I do think that he can finish it and his team can finish it with 4. So, Hopefully, I'm praying. So yeah, hopefully in a year's time we'll get some, uh, you know, some uh, teasers and stuff for the fourth game. My final score of Shenmue 3 is still an 8 out of 10. I did enjoy my time with the game. I think it's a good game overall. It's a good sequel to Shenmue 2. I liked it. 
Um, so yeah, if you guys share the same opinions, go ahead and smash the like button. Um, go in the comments section and tell me if you liked or hated this game. And if you want to keep update with me as a content creator and the content that I make and you want to follow me, someone who's unbiased and just talks real shit, then subscribe to the channel because that's all I do is talk real shit. I'm unbiased in any of my commentaries or, you know, my reviews. So yeah, if that's something you like, go ahead and sub to the channel. Until next time, I've been John from A Guy in His Games and once again... I'm signing out. Peace.